Um, okay, so that's pretty much what I want to talk about when it comes to Latin America. I'm, I'm not sure where we're at on time, but we're going to continue a little bit more. Um, the Russian Empire... Um, so we're going to talk Russian Empire. Okay, Russian Empire really started around 1480 with the fall of the Mongol Empire, um, and it rose in a small region around the city of Moscow. Um, it was an extremely small. Um, it was an extremely small start to the Russian Empire, which would later be the largest landmass empire in the world when you think about Siberia going and then moving into the Slavic nations on the western side of them. Security was the biggest reason for them wanting to expand. They were not um, as quick to jump on this like mercantilism thing. They were a little backwards in how they thought. Um, and it wasn't until really Peter the Great that they were brought into this European ideal of like wealth and status. And so you'll see that as he created St. Petersburg and stuff once we get there. Um, but yeah, fun stuff to look at if you really wanted to. Um, the Russians were more tolerant of all the, of other nationalities, other races than some of their their European counterparts. For example, Catherine the Great, my favorite Catherine, should be your favorite Catherine. No, she's a little rough, but that's okay. She she did come up with this office for Islamic affairs, to which their job was to deal with any problems that have that come up with within the Islam community of the Russian Empire. Um, kind of a novel idea. It was, you know, relatively fair within reason. Um, the Ru Russian Russians were still considered, if you were Russian nationality, you were still considered a little bit better, but at least you had some rights as a minority. Okay. So treatment in Siber Sib Siberia and the steeps was a little bit worse. Um, but what the goal was, was to create these cash crops, right? Because that was the largest area of um, Russia. So they would create cash crops, things like wheat and stuff like that. And they would bring that into Russia to grow the wealth, you know, wheat, furs, those kind of things. Um, and they also had a lot of mineral deposits along those areas that helped to build the Russian Empire of the 1800s. Um, so fighting the rivals in the West was a big deal for them, you know, controlling these you know, Slavic nations down into Germany and the Western Europe. Um, so um, Peter the Great, as I was talking about earlier, so he in, he did a lot of innovations for the Russian Empire when you really think about it. Um, he grew their military because he wanted to compete with these European countries. He wanted to have the same type of country as, you know, um, Portugal and England. He wanted to compete with them. And so you saw them grow politically economically, militarily. They started to have a noble class. Manufacturing picked up under Peter the Great. Um, he, his plan was to move Moscow to St. Petersburg. Really interesting stuff. Um, I highly suggest you look into it. There are plenty of good resources out there for you. Um, all right, so let's talk a little bit about China and... Yeah, let's talk a little bit about China. So we've just seen the fall of the Mongol Empire and what kind of takes place is you have the Qing Dynasty. And the Qing Dynasty was a takeover as a result of crisis. The Great or the Little Ice Age started to really starve a lot of the people in China and the lack of leadership because of the fall of the Mongol Empire really left them in flux. And so you kind of, you saw this like peasant uprising along with a little bit of civil war and what rose out of it was the Qing or Manchu dynasty. Um, security was another big reason to them. Remember in the last 300 years, the Mong empire, or excuse me, yeah, the Mong Mongolians came in, you know, with Genghis Khan and took over China. And so they wanted to secure their borders and make sure the Qing dynasty wanted to make sure that nothing else, no other foreign invaders kind of came in. Um, and so that's why you see the spread of China to what we almost know now. Um, the borders are very similar at that point. Um, so the former Silk Road, it becomes an impoverished area. It is no longer um, this vast network of trade that it was in the in the hundreds of years that followed, you know, since basically um, the Roman time period when the Silk Road really started to take off. Um, and you kind of see this all but end to nomadic to the nomadic practices within 
the region of northwestern China. Um, something really kind of interesting. We have seen a resurgence in our time um, of the Mongolians kind of continuing their lifestyle of living on horseback and hunting and gathering, kind of that nomadic lifestyle. Um, all right, so we're, like I said, it was going to be really brief with China. Now let's be really brief with India during that same time period. And we're going to talk about the Mughal Empire. Um, the Mughal, not Muggle, not like Harry Potter, you know, not that like non-magic folk. Oh, no, I would, what, how much would you give to be a wizard and be able to call somebody a Muggle? That would be so great. Um, but unification under a minority of Muslims. So only 20% of the population was Muslim within India. And they were the ruling class. And so um, at first they started to try to be extraordinarily tolerant of, um, of Hindu religion, the largest religion within Hindu during this or within India during this time period. But you didn't see that as much as like late, as it happens later on. Um, so they continue to try to have this two, two religion practice within India. Um, but what ends up taking place is Sharia or religious law. Um, to me, and remember, don't say Sharia law. That's like saying law law. So, I mean, I love a good law law, you know, but maybe not in that context, right? Um, so we have this ruler, Akbar, okay? Um, most revered, prominent ruler practiced tolerance and he practiced accommodation for the Hindu religion. Afterwards, I'm going to butcher his name, but it's Aurangzeb, Emperor Aurangzeb, reversed that trend and started you started to see persecution and removal of Hindu um, religious acts. He took music out of court. He stopped having them be able to have their Hindu festivals and wanted to really force Sharia, to force um, Islamic religious law within the country of India. Um, and so we're going to talk a little bit more about that um, moving forward, but it was kind of a short-lived empire. Um, so let's talk Muslims, Christians, Ottoman Empire. This part right here just goes bang, bang, bang. Um, so the Ottoman Empire, there's a great map of it on 229 of your Strayer book. I highly suggest you take a look at your maps. You should be looking at your maps regardless of what textbook you use. Um, maps are crucial in understanding the continuity and the change that happens within um, culture. Remember, when we talk about history, we're talking about the development of what we now know and that how did we get from that to here and why do we continue to make these mistakes and understanding maps and regions and the different cultures and how they clash and why they clash is a huge part of it. Okay, so remember, Byzantium falls in 1453, leading to the rise of Istanbul and the Ottoman Empire. Um, However, in the Ottoman Empire, they allow the Balkans to become to continue to be Christian for the most part, um, which is really interesting. If you think about Istanbul, there still is a few um, Christian churches within Istanbul that have either been converted to mosques, and you can still see some of the Christian art in there, um, and that has not been removed. So it's super interesting when you talk about that. Um, but to slow down the growth of Christianity, um, they began to practice of Dev, Dev Shirmet, okay, Dev Shirmet. I think I'm butchering it, but that's all right, um, with young boys. And so the Ottoman Empire would take these young Christian boys and indoctrinate them into the state and have them work for the state. And then within that, if you can grab the children, much like, um, you know, the Hitler Youth, or if you're into 1984 and you've ever read it, the, um, the Youth League, if you can get this, the kids at a young age, you can kind of manipulate which way their life is going to go. And so we saw, or yeah, they saw a lot of, of conversion from Christianity to um, Islam as a result of taking those young boys at an early age. Um, and so the fear of the Ottoman Empire is really part of the reason the, um, the European powers kind of left them alone. There was a, there's a lot of natural resources within the Middle East and the Ottoman Empire. Um, they also were the closest to China when you talk about trade. And they had access to the um, Indian Ocean trade. And so you saw a lot of European countries kind of stay away from it. Um, we saw this in a previous chapter with Mehmed and him getting the Renaissance painter 
over um, Giuseppe over to kind of take a look and paint him or paint a um, portrait of himself or of Mehmed. And so you saw that kind of cultural diffusion. That is it for our material. So if all you wanted was straight to the bones, like get after it kind of material, I tried to do that for you. I think it's going to be a little bit longer than I was hoping. Um, but for those of you guys that know me in my class, I usually talk too much any freaking way. And so um, I'm super excited. Um, I think that it went okay. I know I have some, some things that I need to work on. Um, I would like to now talk a little bit and flip the script and talk of concerts, talk music a little bit, um, but I need a timeout. Hey, what's up? So I'm back. Um, I just needed a quick change. Bring Me the Horizon sure is what I'm repping right now. One of my favorite bands. I absolutely love them. They absolutely smashed it yesterday and were the highlight of my night. Um, we got really close. We were right up in the mix. Um, you know, right, right up in the mosh pit. It had a good time. That was so much fun. Um, so much love in the building, or I shouldn't say in the building because it was completely out in the open. Um, some of the other highlights that I had from that weekend, or at least from Saturday, as I could only go Saturday this year, um, which next year I'll maybe I'll plan and go all three days. Aftershock is one of the largest festivals in the United States. It is all rock music. It is so much fun. Um, people from all over the country come, all over the world come. I met a guy yesterday from New Zealand who is absolutely rocking out and meeting everybody and having a blast. Um, California, especially the Central Valley, it is a jewel of the Central Valley. People all 